spring yet. Here we are. Well, it's the first Sunday of the month, and so today we'll uh, keep the kids in with us. Uh, normally we have kids program uh, on Sunday during the sermon time, but one Sunday a month we like to keep the kids in with us so they get a feel for uh, what uh, big church, as we call it, is all about. And so when they make a transition in the years to come, it'll feel kind of natural to them because they've experienced it off and on over the years. All right? Be all right if I share you a brief little story before I get to the sermon? That'd be okay. Uh, somebody else wrote this and said, Taking advantage of a balmy day in New York, my brother and three other priests swapped their clerical garb for polos and khakis and a time on the golf course. After several horrible shots, their caddy, their caddy asked, are you guys priests? Actually, yes, one cleric replied. Why? Because, said the caddy, I've never seen such bad golf and such clean language. <laughs> uh, we've been in a series, uh, WWJD, What Would Jesus Do? And many of you have had those uh, bracelets over the years um, asking the question, what would Jesus do? And today I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, but listen to some of these things we've been talking about in Christ likeness. We're we're called to be like Christ. That's our goal. It means to be selfless and humble, kind, compassionate, forgiving, obedient, loving servants who trust God and live for righteousness. And then last week we talked about the capability of Christ likeness, and we talked about how um, when Christ is at work in us, we can actually. Uh, experience healings and miracles. And that's the power of God that we believe is still available today. And we actually uh, prayed for people last week, and we've got at least one testimony of a healing. And let's show that testimony. Amen. <laughs> oh, there she is. Hand raised high. Uh, praise the Lord. God can still do healings today. God can still work miracles today. And I just praise the Lord that He confirmed that message. You know, we kind of stepped out in faith after I preached that God can heal. And then we prayed for people just kind of hoping and believing that God would do something. And He did. I love it. I believe we can see even more of that if we uh, keep the faith. Now, today we're in Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to wrap up with this thought, the completeness of Christ-likeness. Ephesians chapter 4, and just a few verses here. I'll start in verse 11. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd, I'd really appreciate it if you would stand as we read the Word and show honor to God's authority here. Here's what it says. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God 
and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. All right, you may be seated. The completeness of Christ. And last week I, uh, I mentioned an old chorus that says the words, To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all I ask, to be like Him. All through life's journey from earth to glory, all I ask, to be like Him. We just want to be more like Jesus. Uh, Romans 8.29 says that we are to be conformed to the likeness of God's Son. And in 1 John 2.6, I know a lot of you have this one memorized. It says, whoever claims to live in Him must walk as Jesus did. We are called to be more like Jesus. And I tell you, that's a very high calling. That's not an easy thing. And yet it's very biblical that we are called to be like Jesus. And the, this completeness of Christ-likeness is is what the Scripture says here and what we talk about from time to time is the fullness of Christ. And it's built right into our vision and mission. It's actually inside, uh, I think, the left side of your bulletin. There's a little picture of a, of a magnifying glass, and it talks about our focus. Um, and that's an acrostic that stands for fullness of Christ, unity, and spiritual maturity. That's what we are looking towards that we would all grow in our faith and ultimately be filled with Christ so much that we would be or have the fullness of Christ in us. In fact, in our My Church class, for people considering becoming new members here, we talk a little bit about this. And here's a quote right from the booklet that we share with them. This uh, bu- building the church and being full of Christ is this, to be filled with the presence, power, and agency, and riches of God and of Christ. Here is the ultimate goal for all believers, that we may be completely filled with and overflowing with God Himself. So we don't want just a little taste of Jesus, but we want Him to completely consume us and live in us and through us. The fullness, the completeness of Christ's likeness. John the Baptist said it very well in John chapter 3, verse 30. I must become less, he must become greater. That's it. And so to be full of Christ, to have him fully living in us, requires that we've got to get out of the way. There's not room for all of us in there. (laughs) We have to clear the way for him. It's the scriptural concept of dying to yourself. You know, scripture says that God is a consuming fire. So if we invite him in, he wants to take over the whole place. Did you know that? God doesn't want just a little bit of your closet space. He wants the whole house. It's true. Now, if that kind of scares you or think think that seems selfish of God, well, here's the deal. If you give Him control of the whole house, He'll run the household for you. And it'll be better than you could run it. That's the deal. Okay? But He wants the whole place We need to die to ourselves. Romans 6.11 says, Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive in Christ Jesus. And the Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Wow, that's quite the statement. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That's what we're talking about. The fullness of Christ. We've got to die to ourselves. We've got to crucify that old sinful nature so that Christ can be fully alive in us and living through us. Jesus taught a similar principle in Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. He said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. Jesus talks about denying yourself. And in order, to, in order to fully follow Christ, you have to die to yourself. Those selfish desires need to be outright crucified. Anybody here ever struggle with selfish desires? Okay. And I, I know one of our board members has said before, um, we tr- sometimes we try to filter those things, but the filter doesn't work very good. What we really need to do is kill them. Got to die. That sinful nature, those sinful desires need to die so that Christ can live in us and through us. And then 
we can reach the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, as it says here in Ephesians chapter 4. The completeness of Christ's likeness. So if we could say along with the Apostle Paul, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I wonder what that would look like. And so let's just kind of take it uh, kind of body parts at a time because we're the, we're the body of Christ, right? Okay? So if he's living in us and through us, how should we behave? What should be happening? And so let's start with the mind and the attitude. The mind and attitude of Christ is one of humility and service. That's the way he thinks. He wants to be humble. He wants to serve. And so if we have the mind and the attitude of Christ, we will be humble and we will serve. Philippians 2, 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then it goes on to describe his humility and his willingness to be a servant. And it says that's the mind we should have as well. His fullness in us will include humility and servitude. Romans 8, 6 says, The mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. Who here doesn't want peace in their life? I mean, come on, everybody wants peace. The mind controlled by the Spirit is peace. And we can contrast that with a worldly mind, which Romans chapter 8 tells us is hostile to God. But the mind of Christ is that of humility and service. And as we are filled with the fullness of Christ, our mind and our attitude should be the same as His. Humility and service. The will of Christ is to always please the Father. That's all He ever wanted to do was please the Father. In John chapter 5, verse 19, it says, The Son can do nothing by Himself. He can only do what He sees the Father doing. And in John chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus said, By Myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and My judgment is just, for I seek not to please Myself, but Him who sent Me. That's the will of Christ to only do what God the Father is directing and what God the Father is doing and just come alongside and partner with God. And so if that's the will of Christ, as He fills us, that will become our will as well. To only do what God would have us do. The worldly will, in contrast, is full of sinful cravings. You find that in 1 John chapter 2. In the natural, we are all inclined towards sinfulness and those cravings. But if we embrace the fullness of Christ, our will will only want to please God. The heart of Christ. His heart is compassionate and merciful. That's who Jesus is. Compassionate and merciful. And aren't you thankful for that? He's merciful. That means no matter how much you have messed up in life, He extends mercy and forgiveness to you. That is good news. And He's compassionate. That means He cares about your situation. Whatever you're going through, He cares because He's compassionate. That's the heart of Christ. James 5.11 says, The Lord is full of compassion. And mercy. And there are a number of scriptures where we see that Jesus was moved by compassion and mercy because he would look on the crowds and he would understand the trouble that they were experiencing and he was just stirred in his spirit with compassion and mercy. That's the heart of Christ. And when we die to ourselves and he fills us completely, that becomes our heart as well that we will be filled with compassion and mercy towards the other people in our lives. Jeremiah 17, verse 9, tells us that a worldly heart is deceitful above all things. We don't want a worldly heart. We want a Christ-like heart full of compassion and mercy. And more about the, the, the fullness of Christ, His work. What, what did Jesus do? 
But we find this in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, where Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's why Jesus was here. That was His work. He went around preaching good news. He went around proclaiming freedom and delivering people and healing people of their blindness and setting people free. That's what Jesus did. And as His body, this is our work as well. Did you know that? We're supposed to do the stuff Jesus did. His work should become more and more natural to us as He fills us completely. And similar to His work, we find the purpose of Christ in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, which says, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. That's why He came. That's His purpose. And as followers of Christ, that becomes our purpose as well, to destroy the works of the enemy. Now, how do we do that? Well, let me tell you how it's done. When people are saved and come to Christ, that destroys the work of the enemy. And when people are filled with the fullness of Christ and transformed inside and all the way through their being, that destroys the devil's work. And so we participate in the purpose of Christ. Contrast that with worldly work and purpose. And we see self-serving. We work to serve ourselves. And our purpose is all about satisfying ourselves. But if we become filled with the fullness of Christ, the completeness of Christ's likeness, then our work and our purpose becomes His. To preach the good news. To destroy the devil's work. To set people free. Now, in the book of Revelation, we find a description of the eyes of Christ. They're like blazing fire. And so, if you're really going to be Christ-like, you're going to shoot laser beams out of your eyes. (laughs) No, not really. Okay? Most commentaries actually comment that this blazing eyes is a description of the all-knowing of Christ. That He sees everything. His eyes are a blazing fire. Now, that is an attribute that can only be ascribed to God and Christ. We will never be all-knowing. Okay? So how do we apply this part of Christ's likeness? Well, I believe it's that we can become eyes, or have eyes that are filled with discernment and wisdom. That's the idea. Also remember, Jesus said He only did what He saw His Father doing. So his eyes were constantly on the Lord, the Father God, to see what God was doing. That should be where our eyes are focused as well. What is God doing? And worldly eyes, in contrast, the Bible says, are full of lust. We don't want worldly eyes. We want godly eyes. And the mouth of Christ is filled with the Word of God. In John chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus says, I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. You get that? Not just what to say, but how to say it. And then in John 14, 10, Jesus said, The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing His work. So, Jesus had the fullness of God the Father living in Him, and He spoke the very words of God. And so, if we've got Christ living in us in fullness, we should be speaking the words of Christ. That was a good spot for an amen. Our mouths should be speaking His Word and standing on His promises. In contrast, a worldly mouth is filled with lies and accusations. But instead, fullness of Christ in us should be quoting the Word, 
standing on the promises of God. Speaking the truth of the Word into our circumstances, even when our circumstances are shouting at us that something contrary to God's Word is going on, we need to declare the Word of God as the truth. And then we come to Christ's hands. His hands were hands of healings and miracles. We found this over and over in the Scripture. In Matthew 8, it's just one example. Jesus reached out His hand and He touched the man and He said, Be clean. And immediately the man was cured of his leprosy. And we see that over and over again. When Jesus touched people, they were healed. It seems that almost anything He touched was restored and made well. And as His fullness consumes us, as we are filled with the presence of Christ, we also should be able to touch and see healings take place. Now you can contrast this with Isaiah 58 verse 4 that says worldly hands are used to hit and they are abusive and deadly. That's not what we're called to. We're called to bring healing into people's lives. And there's, there's many kinds of healing. And often in, in, in Christian circles, we think about healing of the heart and healing of relationships. And we believe that, that Christ can do all of those things. But we also believe He can do physical healings. As we heard from Hope's testimony. God can still do that. And He can work in us to do that. Healings and miracles. The completeness of Christ... I want His fullness. How about you? Not just bits and pieces, but the whole thing. I want the whole deal. Jack Hayford talks about this. And Jack, I I found him to be profoundly wise. And he says, To be like Jesus is generally presumed by most Christians to be a worthy quest of seeking refinement and growth in our personal attitudes, behavior, and ethics that we would become more unselfish, more loving, and more servant-like. These are indeed evidences of Christ-likeness. But I have been increasingly moved to urge leaders and believers alike to biblically and passionately develop a fully Spirit-formed life. One not only Christ-like in character, but also Christ-like in ministry, in power. To pursue Jesus' power in my life as well as His purity is to seek the other half of Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness is a call to Christ's fullness. To pursue less is to succumb to a form of godliness that denies responsibility for functioning in the power thereof. He's still calling His disciples to expect to do the works that I do. Yes, I want the fullness of Christ to change my character. Absolutely. To change my mind. To change my heart. But I'm also wanting to work through my hands to bring healing to people. And the power of God to be displayed in the church today. Confirming His message as we talked about last Sunday. That's the fullness of Christ. And so I ask, you know... Do we want just a portion of Christ? So we've got everything but not His hands. You know, so we've got, we, we start thinking like Christ. We start desiring the things of Christ. You know, we do the stuff. Uh, we preach the gospel, but we never ever heal people. Something's missing. Or what about if we only, if we only have the mouth, but we don't have any of the other parts. So we say what the Bible says, But our heart isn't in it. Our mind and our will are not conforming to Christ-likeness. Then that can come across very harsh to people. We need the whole package, people. How about only His work? So we we just do the biblical stuff, but we don't discern with, with godly eyes what He really wants us to do. And we don't speak the way He would speak. And we don't really follow His purposes. We're just kind of trying to do some work. That is less than what He's called us to do. I want the whole package. 
the fullness of Christ. Everything. And God desires nothing less than Christ in us. That's what He wants. Christ in us. The completeness of Christ-likeness. And I'll confess to you today that i got a long ways to go. But it's in my sights. How about you? I don't want to just say, yep, yeah, i got Jesus. i got my ticket. So I can go to heaven and I don't have to go to hell. Okay? That's step one. There's about a million more steps to take. Let's keep going on. And be completely filled with the fullness of Christ. What is the fullness of Christ? If I could just put it into three words, here's what it is. His passion, His purity, His power. I want it all. Not just one of those things, but the whole deal. The completeness of Christ like. Let's make that our goal. The whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Not satisfied with a little, but pressing on and opening ourselves more and more to the Lord Jesus Christ in our life. That's what we need. And I, I just keep coming back to this over and over again uh, I, when I meet with people one-on-one -on -one and, and from the pulpit here. I, you just need more of Jesus. Over and over again, that just comes up. What you need is more of Jesus. you're struggling with a, a sinful tendency in your life, you need more of Jesus. Because if Jesus is in you and living through you, he, He's not going to sin. So you need more of Jesus. You hear what I'm saying? If you're struggling with uh, some attitudes, you need more of Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't struggle with an attitude. You just need more of Jesus. That's the answer. I know it's kind of simple. But the answer is Jesus. You need more of Jesus. And not just a little. The whole deal. That's what I want. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. God, we thank You that this is even a possibility that we could be filled with Christ. Wow. But we thank You that this is Your desire for us. And Lord, we surrender to You today. And we say, yes, Lord Jesus. Come and fill us completely. We don't want just a part, but we want everything that You're offering, Lord. All of it. And we give ourselves also, we don't just give a part of ourselves to you, but we give ourselves fully to you. The house is yours, God. We surrender to you. Have your way in us and fill us completely with everything you've got. Let your will be done in us. Give us your mind, your heart. Your words help us to see as you see. Help us to do what you do. God, we know it's only by your grace. But we hear the word today and we say yes to your word. That's what we want. We want what you want. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand and let's wrap up with our theme song for the series here. What would Jesus do? Lord, we fix our eyes on you. Help us do what you would do. Give us grace to always follow you. 
We set our hearts on things above. It's you alone that we will trust. Let our words be prompted by your love. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? He's our example, Lord, in all our ways and for all our days. Help us resemble you. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? He's our example, Lord, in all our ways and for all our days. Help us resemble you. Lord, we fix our eyes on you. Help us do what you would do. Give us grace to always follow you. We set our hearts on things above. It's you alone that we will trust. Let our words be prompted by your love. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? He's our example, Lord, in all our ways and for all our days. Help us resemble you. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? He's our example, Lord, in all our ways and for all our days. Help us resemble you. Amen. Lord, that is our heart's cry. We want to be more like Jesus. Work in us, God, to do that as we surrender to you. Fill us with your presence. In the fullness of Christ, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you're going to be dismissed here in just a moment, uh, but Naomi and I are going to be here at the front. If there's any that would like prayer, we'd love to pray with you, whatever it may be. Um, the rest of you are...